Hi everybody, welcome back to The Great Reset, Reset by Systems Change Alliance. Systems Change Alliance offers a platform where individuals and organisations discuss and offer solutions to the unprecedented economic, social and environmental crisis that our planet is facing. We recognise that these challenges are interconnected and overlapping and require deep systemic change. My name is Satya Tanner and I'm your host for the first session. We've just heard about localization and now we're going to hear about macro history in the next 100 years by Sahail and Ayatollah. He asks the question, can we make the transition from a system that creates wealth but is equitable with high, envi with high environmental costs to the planet to a Gaian system that is prosperous, fulfilling for people and also good for the planet. Sahail and Ayatala, PhD, is a researcher at metafuture.org, an international think tank focused on creating alternative and preferred futures. And Ayatala has authored and edited 30 books, journal special issues, and over 350 journal articles and book chapters, as well as contributed articles to the Oxford Encyclopedia of Peace, the Rutledge Encyclopedia of Philosophy, the Macmillan Encyclopedia of the Future, and, his, and the UNESCO Encyclopedia of Life Support Systems. His most recent book is Asia 2038, 10 Disruptions That Change Everything. So Sahail, welcome. Thanks so, thanks so much, great to be here. Now, um, please uh, let us know uh, macro history and the next 100 years, take it away. Thanks, I'll uh, go to share screen and let's start this. So I think uh, this is really looking at the big picture. We're gonna to try to go forward and make sense of the futures of the world economic system. Now, I want to start with one of my teachers, Emmanuel Wallerstein, and his main conclusion was the challenges faced by the current system can't be resolved in the terms of the system. Capitalism is the endless, endless accumulation of wealth, more, more, more is the narrative, and it's a system based on private property. The, the problems being solved, we have to go to a different level of analysis. So what are all these crises? Clearly there's the ecological, humans and nature. There's dramatic aging and now depopulation in many parts of the world. There's a crisis of meaning, there's climate change, deep crisis of inequity, participation, who's allowed to be part of this, a gender crisis calling for women to fully participate, and a crisis within the West itself saying what's next, what's new. It suggests Mars, is that it? Or is there something else that matters? Really those tough questions we're asking ourselves, can we make the transition to global governance, renewable energy? If the planet is like a teenager, can we make the transition to becoming an adult? Teenagers fight, they're in cliques, they have paranoia, they're not centered, they don't have a sense of basically the group as a whole. Can we make the transition from wealth for the few to a Gaian polity, prosperity, people, planet, and purpose? And finally, going further, can we go from a masculinist system, one view, conflict-based, to a coordinated cooperative system, as Sri Sarkar talks about? So this is really asking, can we make this transition? If so, how will we make it? These crises are planetary, they're intensifying, everyone's facing them, as we've seen through COVID-19. My favorite quote is from the words of Yang Chu, while weeping at the crossroads. Isn't it here that you take a half step wrong and wake up a thousand miles astray? So there's decisions we have to make. My colleague Graham Taylor calls it the great bifurcation. Can we move to a more complex system, greater human evolution, social evolution, or will we fragment as we're seeing in many parts of the world, India, for example, Israel, Palestine, for example, where fragmentation is occurring because we're unable to go to the next level of human evolution. And clearly we're in the COVID crisis. None of us know what's going to happen. My talk, Futures Thinking, where I'm, I'm the UNESCO Chair in Future Studies, we don't pretend to know what's gonna happen, but we look at patterns and we say, what might happen? Scenario one is the great despair. The next 10 years, there's mutation after mutation, deaths after deaths, things get worse. This is almost the world of the zombie apocalypse. Zombie as a narrative. We see people we don't like, we assume they're zombies, people feel worse. We've seen the mental health statistics, angst, anxiety, fear. Or is this the needed pause? 
people slow down, reflect on their life, think about the next stage in human evolution. Can this even lead to a global health awakening? Planet, people, prosperity, purpose. We're already seeing some of the scientific breakthroughs coming from COVID-19 vaccinations could in fact lead to new breakthroughs in dealing with cancer. But the real issue is not about the technologies per se, but are we helping create a new way to identify who we are? Our identities are based on the nation state and are based on our social, emotional sensibilities, who we identify with. Can we make the shift if we're going to create global governance, a world after capitalism, where we're identifying with ourselves as first human beings? That's difficult for many because there's angst. If we're used to being one particular nation, there's a decentering as we go greater complexity and say, no, first, I'm a human being, first on this planet. This is difficult for everyone, but to make this transition, what Wallerstein says, we cannot solve the problem within the terms of the nation state, within the terms of world capitalism, something else has to be created. So this is the transition to a new identity, not just a new economic system. One of my teachers, Ashish Nandi, called it the Gaia of civilizations. Sri Sarkar called it a bouquet of flowers, multiple cultures, multiple civilizations, guided by spirit, guided by indigenous knowledge, using dramatic new technologies, but earth at the center. So this is adopting new AI technologies, but remembering spirit, remembering tradition, and focused on using the technologies for greater inclusion and greater peace. But it's not written, nothing is written right now. We're in the period of transition. So is this a continuation of capitalism, patriarchy and imperialism? We can easily see that if you look at that image there, the sun's above the male, nuclear technologies, man above earth. That's the key narrative we've had for 500 years, which has pushed away females, pushed away the others and pushed away nature. So we're trying to decide what's the new narrative, what are the systems? To make sense of this, we use macro history large patterns of change. I wrote a book with Johan Galton called Macro History, Macro Historians, another one called Situating Sarkar, a third called Transcending Boundaries. So these are books looking at big patterns of change, asking ourselves not what's tomorrow, but the next 20, 50, 100 years. And there's some core master macro historical shapes, the linear, the cyclical, the pendulum, the spiral. We'll explore some of these as a way to think about what's next. There's Ibn Khaldun, who talks about the cycle, Spencer, progress, August Kant, modernity, Sorkin, pendulums, and so forth. So the key first is we start to think about the future, we recognize there can be decline. What Khaldun said, once you have influence, you're in power over generations, they decline. So be ready for decline, but think about ways to create what you call Ashabiya, greater unity. But where should this unity come from? The nation state, one's religion. Now here, the pathway, the doorway out is a Shabia through being human. Having a Gaian identity, identity, that's a pathway out of decline. Otherwise, we'll stay as a teenager in the world of cliques, not as a wise elder in the world of everyone. Now, certainly, August Kant responds to this and says, yes, there's cycles but there's also the possibility of rise, more development, more economic development, more science, more technology. And that's a response. If you look at Ibn Khaldun writing the 14th century, you have these Western thinkers writing four or 500 years later, talking about the economic rise. And that's our situation today. The rise of the world capitalist system in the 15th century, we've had 500 years of economic rise in some sectors of the world. We've pushed away nature, pushed away gender, pushed away the others. So have we reached a possibility of a bifurcation? Taking the view of the rise will continue. We don't have to make a big change. We can ask ourselves, will East Asia actually optimize capitalism using science technology, using space exploration? China just got to Mars, using the global brain, linking our brain minds through technology and using even meditation, not to transform, but to optimize. Can Asia, in fact, reinvigorate capitalism 
That's one possibility here. So this is going from the iron rice bowl we had in the 50s, 60s to the 3D AI printed rice bowl. Going from a problem to every solution as we see in Asia to anything is possible. So in this world, the rise continues, but not from the West, but from East Asia. So if we go off 50, 100 years, we see this amazing rise throughout East Asia. The third alternative, of course, is Petrum Sorkin. You get the pendulum back and forth. We've had 500 years of sensate civilization, materialistic civilization, and now there's a sensate shift towards spiritual civilization, ideational civilization. But he goes further. Is it possible by 2150 to have an integrated civilization? We've had periods of sensate, only matter matters, only money matters, and then periods of ideational where we're debating how many angels on a pin. We're only, only debating issues of the spirit. Can we create both a spirit and matter type civilization? If so, who would lead that? Toynbee asked that question. Who will be the creative minority? In every system, there's some on the leading edge. Some lead us forward. They have the imagination of what can be. They're pulling us forward in this new direction. Most live in today, battling, fighting over today's ideas. Some imagine the new future. They pull us, as Fred Pollock said, they pull us towards the new future. Toynbee says, who are the creative minority? And this leads to the, think the thinker Sri Piyar Sarkar. He says, they in fact are the Sadvipras, people who understand that history is cyclical. After one group comes in power, there's a revolution, then the next group gets in power, but it's still a cycle. There's no transformation in deep culture, in civilization. There's no guy in entity, identity. We're just fighting in the circle. He suggests a new type of leadership that's focused on the image of the future, that works and serves, that protects, that inspires, that innovates through wealth, ensures the money keeps on rolling. This type of leadership moves from the endless cycle or the endless linearity to the spiral, where we evaluate what part of tradition we use and we have a new image of the future that includes spirit plus mind, spirit plus technology, values plus technology. So he has four archetypes here. So let's look at the next 100 years within Sarkar's archetypes. One is the worker, second is the warrior, there is the intellectual, and fourth is the person who accumulates capital. In his model, today, we're basically in what's called the world capitalist system, nation state-based. Within nations, there's some peace. Outside, it's chaos. We don't have an international system agreements on child trafficking. How do you stop it? We don't have agreement on climate change. There's so many things we have. We're working on multilateral agreements, but we don't have them. Within nations, there's some security. Outside, there's none. This creates the contradictions and why we're at a bifurcation point. He suggests there's going to be what's called the workers' revolution, shooter revolution. There's two types of this. Type one is a violent revolt against political economic power, saying we've had enough. We're sick of being in the bottom while you make billions. My colleague Jose Ramos, Michelle Bovin says, yes, that's possible. But what if Sri Sarkar suggested is the peer-to-peer a nonviolent revolution, what's called the peer-to-peer -peer commons. Greater efficiency, the, co the cooperative world, the sharing economy world, what if in fact that creates the revolution? The third possibility is globalization through new ideas, what the previous speaker talked about. Greater rights, it's within the current system, but more stakeholders are included. It's a capitalism with a human face, with a nature face. Deepak Chopra talked about that. The best capitalism includes workers, includes everyone. This is reformist. And finally, what might a different type of world system look like? Where the polity at what some level was centralized, clear rules on climate change, on travel, on pandemics. This is using artificial intelligence to create what's called economic bioregions. So your identity is no longer based on I live in this country, this state, your identity based on here's your bioregion and use artificial intelligence to increase efficiency and reduce inequity. This is a strong global regulatory system. That's why many people don't like it. It will regulate wealth accumulation, a maxi mini. It regulates, ensures gender inclusion, the use of nature and rights of animals and plants. It comes through sticks and carrots. So these are four different possible futures for the next 100 years. 
Will we continue the world capitalist system? Will there be a revolution of the commons, workers' revolution? Will be these new ideas, capitalism with a human face? Or in fact, are we going towards a global governance system centralized, but the economy totally decentralized through new technologies? Clearly, right now, in Sri Sarkar's view, we're on the verge of this transition. What will there emerge next? Will it be reformist or the radical world government system? Now, there's another way to think about this. That's using big patterns of change. The other way to talk about it is alternative futures. So let me give you a model. The simple one, when you think about scenarios, is no change. Nothing really changes. It's all the same. 50 years from now, we still have a world capitalist system, except Elon Musk now lives in Mars and he's living longer. Basically, that's it. Marginal change. Well, capitalism says, okay, we can only survive if we give more rights to females, give more rights to nature. This is stakeholder inclusion. That's some marginal change to keep the system going. Who saves the day? China saves the day. East Asia becomes what Hegel says, the Geist moves from the US the Geist moves to East Asia, the Bushido ethic, hard work, next generation is better, you get marginal change in world capitalism. Adaptive looks very different. The game starts to change, deeper, deeper inclusion, and there's the radical where everything changes. So as an example, I've done that with technologies, the no change, computers come in, you still sit in roles. This is based on Ivana Milicevic's work on all alternative educational futures. Marginal change, you're sitting in rows, but now there's a Skype bot. There's a robot there teaching you. Adaptive, student has access to knowledge, information 24 seven everywhere. It's student centered. Radical, humans, nature, technology co-evolve. Knowledge, the nature of knowledge changes as we connect more with spirit, more with technology, more with ourselves. So we're possibly becoming more and more radical with going onwards. So what does that mean? In the no change world, let's call it members only. Capitalism is a members only club. If you wanna join, work hard, make a billion dollars. Now we know what project we've just done with one government, they said, this leads to sliding backwards. In a world where everything is changing, no change means if you're at the bottom, you'll be even more at the bottom and more will join the bottom as we're seeing with COVID-19. Marginal is again, as I said earlier, you have some gender equity, some climate change mitigation, the move towards renewables. It's the beginnings of the triple bottom line, prosperity, parts of the planet and more people. East Asia saves a day, as a club, the door to the club begins to open. And why does it open? Well, the billions made from having more gender inclusion. It's a $77 billion question just in Asia. So of course, marginal change will work. Marginal change is giving human nature rights to rivers. So that's moving, moving, moving towards it's progressive. As in New Zealand, a river was given personhood status as we're seeing also in Bolivia. And we know from the data, the more diverse you are, the better you do. So diversity inclusion of females, minorities enhances, it optimizes your performance. So we're seeing many groups say, okay, that's a much better capitalism, let's join that. But adaptive said yes, but you're still not catching up. You're still in the terms. This is a 500 year pattern we're seeing. You can't just change marginally, more is needed. What is that more? So one is from cooperatives, corporatives, corporatives to platform cooperatives. Second is a global or multilateral treaties for taxation for the billionaires. You can use AI for people on the street, help the poor with real-time information on pricing, on climate, on markets. New technologies allowing far greater abundance, i.e. solar energy, 3D printed vegan steaks, real-time technology for everyone reducing poverty a maxi mini wage in nations and then globally. So this starts to talk about the new club. One is the old club, club door opens. Here, you're starting to create the new club. This starts to move towards a very much a transformed capitalism. One way to move that is allow the movement of labor. Even the conservative magazine, The Economist suggests 
if we allow more labor movement, there's $78 trillion in wealth that's sitting there. We can create $78 trillion of global wealth by just opening borders, allowing labor to go where it needs to go. We won't be swamped. We will create new ideas, business innovation, for example, care for the aged, and workers will become more productive if they know they have the right to move. In New Zealand metaphor, this was called sharing is winning. Platform cooperatives, movement, protect nature. So this goes from Uber enhancing efficiency to the workers owning Uber. You do that in every nation and you do that globally. In one country, in Egypt, we call this the Alibaba transformation. You give the new technologies to the poor, they're empowered, they have real-time information, they can actually have information on markets, capital, and this empowers them. And now wealth doesn't get created by giving tax, tax cuts to the wealthy, wealth gets created by enhancing demand from below. They can create cooperatives through AI, through new platforms. This becomes the adaptive way. Within the green model, it's going from the linear economy to the circular economy, to the regenerative economy. And finally, what I'm suggesting here, as Sri Sarkar said, Prama, the dynamic equilibrium transformation economy. Now, the last scenario is the radical. I can see the other three emerging. This is now pushing us, well, what's afterwards as we go towards the end of this century? Why is the radical important? It's the image that leads. Of course, it's not gonna happen in 2022. That's nonsense. We even 2032, equally nonsensical. But as these great patterns moving towards different energy systems, more equity, as we move towards the adaptive, next comes the radical. And the radical is the imagination of what's impossible today. So part of our work in progressive forces and new economics, future studies, is to start to imagine the radical. As Pollock says, the utopians, my own professor, Jim Dater said, well, don't say utopia, that's no place, say utopia, E-U-T-O-P-I-A, a good place. And this image of the future advances us, helps us create a different world. So what might this radical change look like? Going back to Sri Sarkar's model, it's moving from global governance, multilateral treaties around gender equity, maxi mini, to real global governance. Now that happens through regional associations, an African Union, a European Union, a North American Union, a South American Union, an Asian Union, an Oceanic Union. These unions start to work together, nations get softer, regional associations get stronger, and then you start to talk about world governance. So that's AI with peer-to-peer -peer cooperatives, with gender equity, with maxi mini. And this starts to move from the story of more, more, more to Actually, we have more than enough. In the financial world, in the intellectual, spiritual world, we're still desiring to create more inclusion. So let's talk about this. This goes from the world we're seeing, from the single bottom line to the quadruple bottom line. People, planet, prosperity, purpose. It's today's it's investment and savings plus regulation and individual effort. The system reproduces through accumulation. Tomorrow, it's policies for, policies for deep inclusion, a UBI, or universal basic assets, sustainability. Today, it's the worldview is capitalism for the few. Tomorrow, we're thinking about wealth for all that keeps on increasing. Today, our metaphor is the invisible hand and more, more, more. Tomorrow's metaphor is prama, the dynamic balance a very different way of seeing the future. So let's conclude here. It's a global economy by 2050, 2075, based on prama and well-being. COVID-19 is clearly showing everyone without health, there's no wealth. Focus on climate change, focus on pandemics, stop going into areas where there's wildlife, create buffer zones, respect animals, respect nature, change, from basically industrial model to work till you die to the well being model. Every organization I work with, the well being model is like, that's the new way forward. Well being is the way to go. Second is going just from capitalism, large corporations, 
We have Uber, Airbnb, et cetera, saying, well, there's inefficiencies. Let's bring assets we're not using into the market. So we optimize. The radical is saying, wait a second, who should run those more efficient organizations? It should be the people working in them, the Uber drivers themselves, for example. The next part of that shift is the fossil fuel shift to the global solar energy regime. Each home, for example, is a battery. Solar is getting cheaper and cheaper. This starts the transition to abundant energy. We're already seeing efforts by some countries to think, okay, we can do that home by home. How can we bring in what's called the Dyson solar energy ships, energy straight from the sun to earth? At the level of governance, we're starting to imagine the nation state is not eternal. It was created, it was invented. We now need to invent more associations and start to invent a global governance system. When we think about confederations, when we work in Asia, we see the metaphor of one restaurant chain as nation states. How about an Asian food court or a Gaia of organizations, diversity and unity. We're focused on past wars and injustices. Let's focus on future benefits. Let's let the vision of the future drive us. Now, central to this is a shift from materialism defining me. I'm just matter. I'm just my body to mind-body integration. It's not mind over body. It's mind and body moving together. And finally, something called the spiritual episteme. How do I know? I know through basically my imagination of the future. You know from deep love. Truth C. Sarkar talks about different ways of knowing. There's authority, there's rationality, there's empiricism, but he goes further and says, in fact, at the spiritual level, there's also the notion that love is also a way of knowing. That's one way to actually understand the world. So this is actually the rebirth of enchantment. Officially, our work in future studies is defined as a study of possible, preferred, and plausible futures. Now that's a technical definition. How do you re-enchant that? What metaphors do you bring? Do you talk about Ananda? Do you talk about, who do you talk about here? So often we talk about what's our role in creating this transition. So I ask everyone listening to this, if you accept that we're at a bifurcation, we can fragment more war, more poverty, or we can go to a complex adaptive evolutionary evolved system. What's my story in that? Are you the wizard? Are you the benevolent witch? Are you the imagine? Are you the cyber weaver weaving the new stories? So whatever it is, it's figuring out what's your role in this macro grand final year transformation. It's both levels. There's a 500 year end of the world capital system. We're in this transition. None of us know what's gonna be next. Clearly we do know without gender partnership, gender cooperation, none of us make the transition. Gender cooperation leads to huge wealth. Gender partnership leads to foundational transformation. So let me sum this up. The next 100 years, we can crash and burn. We can do no change, which is like going backwards, actually, or we make the transition, a world of hegemons, to in fact, we're seeing the rise of East Asia, rise of global governance, the rise of the associations. Fossil fuel to renewable, materialism to mind, body, to spiritual episteme generally a meat-based system to a more vegetarian system with something called 3D printed, what's called pure meat, and a change and the end of patriarchy. Nicholas Kardashev, a macro historian says, this is actually a transition of cosmic proportions. We're in a world, what he called a type one planet. Our energy needs are infinite, but our systems of governance are narrow nation state religion based there. I, so we need to have high energy and energy needs high energy and we have to shift to the type of system we have governance system. He said that's what's called a type two system. We become global, we become planetary and our energy needs shift as we go towards renewables. Finally, we of course have to move out of earth and have energy needs throughout the solar system and then going further. So this is the nice next 500 years that we first create a Gaian polity. Then of course we go further into a solar system polity. Now, is this at all possible? 
Now, again, this goes to your story. Do you, are you positive? Are you negative? Can you see some of the inklings? Can you see the weak signals? Returning back to Sri Sarkar, he suggests that in fact, part of this is there's cosmic mind. There's a spiritual part of human history is tragic. It's violent, it's oppressive. Systems innovate, then they obfuscate. He says, but we need to remember there's a part of life that does create the novel, that does innovate, and he sees it as universal humanism, remembering that we're all actually on the planet together, this Gaian imagination. Based on that, his conclusion is the future is not bleak, but the future is resplendent, the future is bright. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks very much, Sahail. Um, so basically, you know, you outlined, you know, the problem, the challenge that we're at right now with respect to this bifurc bifurcation, um, this crossroads that we're currently standing at, and you've presented some alternative futures that are laying before us, depending on which path we, we pick. And uh, certainly some of those futures are more appealing uh, than others. Um, my question for you is, uh, how do we influence which future ends up on our doorstep? So the influence question, one is macro historical. Those things, there's not so much we can do. Systems have contradictions. When they mature, those contradictions expand and they die. So that's one part of the game. The second part is thinking through what's my zone of control. I can't influence the entire planet. Where can I influence? Is it the words I speak? Is it how I imagine the future? Is it what image the future I speak, talk about, and enact? Now, there's a third level. So one is a change in consciousness. The second, of course, are the macro history, macro big patterns of change. The third level is called institutional change. That is lobbying. That actually is asking within my nation state, my community, for new laws that are pro-nature, pro-gender equity, pro-moving towards uh, plant base, pro moving towards inclusion. So those are four or five things we can actually very clearly do in every country. Let's move in a progressive direction. So that's at the legislative level. There's a personal level living one story. And there's a macro historical level where there's deep patterns, which in fact, those are contradictions. I wonder what those contradictions are. Systems that have contradictions cannot go forever. It's just basically yeah. it when you look at world systems theory. So those will change. How will they change depends on our story, our actions, and the ability to create new laws. Crisis forces to change who we are and forces to change laws around, for example, simple things like wildlife areas, how we see nature. So would you say that... Um any of these particular alternatives that we're looking at then are more feasible based on the trends that we currently see. I understand it has to do with the story that we carry. So based on the stories that we currently carry, which is the most likely future, do you think? So I work, I mean, with different uh, nation states at the last, it, with the, we were working with UNSCAP in Asia, government of New Zealand, government of Egypt, uh, UNHCR, whole range of international organizations just finished a project for WHO. It was become very clear in these international meetings and speeches is the no change is not sustainable. No change has led to COVID-19. No change will lead to more poverty, more violence. Marginal change gets you in the right area, getting out of just prosperity. But given the rate of technological change is so quick in artificial intelligence, for example, you're actually going to slide backward. It's also not maintainable. So to me, there's only two choices, adaptive change from just prosperity to prosperity, planet people, which is let me have more minorities, more female gender equity, more maxi mini, because the system as a whole will live longer with that. So stakeholder capitalism, for example, it's gonna do better. However, if the entire system, even if you make it better, optimize it, the contradictions are so great, even that's not going to go. So then you have what's called the rollover, the transition. So that's scenario four, the radical. 
And so what I suggest to every company, every country, every person, move towards the adaptive, be ready for the radical. Mm. Once the radical hits, where are you going to be in that? Will you have a cooperative economy? Will you have deep gender inclusion? Will you be living and using nature for everyone to benefit? Or will you, or will you be living the world of fossil fuels and suddenly from being the big man on the king, you're in the bottom in the ocean. Mm. You were Kodak by progress. So here's a question then, if people are having their individual narratives, their individual stories, and they have to be ready potentially for such a change in their narrative, they've gone from the king of the pile to at the bottom, let's say, with regards to narrative transformation, what would be, well, what might be a narrative transformation that helps a person to adjust to that kind of change? So that's exactly, I mean, you've actually set that up perfectly. So there's constructive and destructive narratives, right? Yeah. So which, I mean, Ivanim Levitch talks about in her speech a few days ago, which are the stories that construct this adaptive and radical future? Do I have a story that helps in that or does my story hurt in that? Now in these transitions going to Sorkin, there's pendulum shifts back and forth. We saw that in the US recently dramatic pendulum shift back four years in the last four years. We're seeing that in India. So we're seeing fascism feels good for many because they're focusing on their ethnic group, their leader using symbols of religion, but the contradictions in fascism every time lead to what we're seeing in Brazil, India, what we saw in the US. The system eats alive its own. So that story, again, what we saw in World War II led to death, it's led to death here too. So then the constructive narrative is choose life. And then you ask, well, what does that mean? Well, what's my relationship with nature? What's my relationship with spirit? And I would say really using AI, new technologies, my relationship with technologies, my relationship with others. So those are some easy ways personally to think, okay, where am I playing in? Where are the places I wanna play in? Am I playing in futures orientation, this new world that we're creating, or am I playing in the old world? Now that doesn't with what Sheikh Yamani said, he said the stone age, he was the minister of oil uh, with OPEC. The stone age did not end for lack of stone, but the stone age did end. The oil age will also end not because of lack of oil. The nation state will end not because of lack of nations. The meat age, will end not because of lack of meat. Patriarchy will not, not end because of lack of men. These are grand transitions, adaptive radical, they're emerging, how will we play in them? So perhaps we could say that it, instead of being on top of the mountain to transform that narrative to on top of the dying garbage heap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, exactly. in, instead choose life, choose the bouquet of flowers, yeah. choose the diverse rainforest. Yeah, it's much better. Those, um, and those are fantastic. And those who are worried they'll get poor, then it's the institutions to ensure there's a maxi mini, we work together. Yeah, great. Excellent. I'm just checking if we've got any other questions in the chat. I don't think we do, but so I just want to thank you for your time, Sahail. It's been a real pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks so much. As per usual. And um, yeah, we certainly hope to uh, chat with you again at some point soon. That'd be great. Thanks. Thanks for the great reset. Thanks for all the amazing work you folks are doing. And very happy to be part of this.